Thank you for choosing this resource by Creflo and Taffy Dollar. Our goal is to provide an understanding of God's grace and empower change. Now listen to the gospel taught with simplicity and understanding and watch it change your life. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 17. Now, one of the things that we're going to look at here today is it's going to show us just where we are in time. And uh, it's going to show us a lot of things about what's going on. It may give some answers to some questions that you've had about, you know, why are people carrying on the way that they're carrying on. And so we're going to begin this today. We're going to talk about understanding modern day idolatry. Idolatry. And so I want to just kind of in just look at some scriptures so that you can check the attitude out and then I'll begin to explain to you what idolatry is. And it's vital that you understand this because I'm going to I'm going to need you to to preach it. I'm going to need you to explain it. In the book of Acts, chapter 17 and verse 16, verse 16, uh, verse 16 says this. He says, Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, oh, he says that the city was full of idols, full of idolatry. Now, don't misunderstand what he's saying in this verse of Scripture. His spirit was stirred. It didn't, didn't mean that he was excited. That, that word translation is, is troubled. He was troubled because he looked at the whole city and saw that the whole city was in, in, in idolatry. Think of that. The whole city was in idolatry. The city was full of idolatry. And so now what is it about idolatry that caused Paul to be troubled? He was troubled in his heart uh, because he, he was in Athens, and he saw that all of Athens was full of idolatry, and it troubled him. Now one of the things I want us to get a hold of is that you know, first of all, is it possible that we can look at our city and see that the whole city is full of idolatry? I'll answer that and say, yeah. Is it possible for us to look at our state and to look at our nation and to look at the world, and I'll go as far as to say, and the whole world is full of idolatry, and yet not many are troubled because we just don't know what it is. Why was he troubled? when he saw that the whole city was full of idolatry. So that's one point. Let's look at the second point here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and, and, and verse 14. This is going to be groundbreaking in your thinking and, and your Christian life. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 14, he says this, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, watch this, flee from idolatry. Flee from it. So here's Paul. He looked at it. He saw it. It troubled him. Then we go to this scripture. He says, when you see idolatry, flee from it. Get away from it. So what is it about idolatry where this recommendation says to flee from idolatry? Get away from it. And then look at this third point here that we see. This is just, this is our opening, our introduction here. 1 John 5, 21. I want to look at it in two versions. 1 John 5, 21, the King James, and then 1 John 5, 21, the New Living Translation. Let's look at the King James first. The King James, 1 John 5, 21, he says, he says, uh, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Keep yourselves from idols, amen. Now, for most people, you think, well, keep yourself from the little statues and keep yourself, no, no. He says, keep yourselves from idols. So Paul was troubled by idolatry 
Then he said, flee from idolatry. Then he said, keep yourself from it. I mean, we have to know what this is if it's that vital that his response is, is this. Now, now the, next, the next translation is going to give us a little insight on what idols and idolatry is about. Look at the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation, 1 John 5, 21. All right. He says, uh, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. Keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. Stay away from anything. So that's what an idol is. It's anything that will try to get you to replace God in your heart. The Scripture says anything that might take God's place. Can you recall or can you put your finger on anything in this life that has taken God's place? Anything or anyone that has taken God's place. He said, stay away from anything or anyone that has taken God's place. So that's a little, that's a little key to it. Now, I must now go to this next point. Let's now spend the next several minutes on what is idolatry. I'm so excited about this. I'm, I'm ready to preach right now, but I got to realize I got to, I got I to gotta bring you along with me, amen? I can't be hollering and screaming and shouting and doing Jane Brown split and don't nobody know what I'm shouting about, all right? So notice what it says. Let's, let's, let's talk about what is idolatry. Let's, 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 let's start off with what we just saw in, uh, in 1 John 5, 21. What is idolatry? All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give layers of definitions so that you can begin to see the layers that are involved in, in idolatry. So here's the first la layer. Idolatry is replacing God as priority in your life with anything or anyone. Idolatry is replacing God. Replacing God. In other words, God at one time was your major priority, so it's replacing God as priority. So if God was at one time the first priority in your life, and now he's, he's at number five, idolatry is whatever you replace God with, a person or a thing. He says whatever you replace God with, the something or the someone, that's when it's idolatry. You see, you must understand that there's nothing greater than God. And how is it that we can take something or someone else and put them in God's place? And he says, what Paul was saying was, is he looked at the whole city and he, and he discovered that the whole city has replaced God with someone or something else. And he said, you need to run away from anything that has the potential of replacing God from someone, replacing God with something or, or someone. He says, stay away from that, flee from that, run from that. Now, let's go to Colossians chapter 3. We're, we're, we're nailing in, we're zeroing in on the root meaning of idolatry, the root meaning of idolatry. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3 and 5. Colossians chapter 3 and 5. Now, let's take it from another perspective. He, he says here, Mortify, that word mortify means to put to death or to separate yourself from. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Put to death and mortify fornication. Put to get death and mortify uncleanness, inordinate affections, evil concupiscence, and covetous, covetousness. Put that to death. But notice what it says there, covetousness, comma, which is idolatry. So, we, we've got to take some time to look at covetousness because the Bible says here that is idolatry. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, I don't want everybody to get caught up on all these religious terms and just not know what it means. Because how are you going to talk to Christians and talk to people? You know, we've got we to meet people where they are. And we can't, you can't go talking to people, you know, you know, oh, the anointing is, man, man, man ain't even saved. He don't know what anointing is. We got to get down on people's level. You know, people, 
the, the, the greatest number of people who've decided not to believe in God is in this time. There are more people that don't believe in God today than ever before. Why? Because there's been a whole lot of ministry malpractice in the pulpit. Oh, my God, I felt that thing. <laughs> ministry malpractice in the pulpit and, and the th and things that are going on. When you look at a Christian, you don't want to be like them because we've deceived the world into thinking that Christianity is perfection. And so when they don't see perfection, because you, you put that up there, Christianity is perfection, when they don't see it, they think something wrong with your thing. But you got to start telling the truth. Christianity is not perfection. Christianity is a person who sees God as my source for everything. And even when I'm messed up, he's still my source. Christianity is not beating somebody down because they failed to reach perfection. You, God didn't make you perfect. Now, Adam and Eve were, but they messed it up for everybody, so everybody at that particular point was born into sin, shaped into iniquity, and we need to quit playing that little game. You, you, you put it out there. I'm flawless. So when you fail, people are like, there must not be anything to your thing. That's not the truth. If we were flawless, we wouldn't need God. If we were perfect, we wouldn't need Jesus. I don't know about you, but I need a Savior, praise the Lord. And what happens is he gets me better and better and better. So when I finally reach that goal, I have no choice but to give God the honor, the glory, and the praise. And I have no choice but to say, look at what God has done. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Somebody knew you 30 years ago, and they look at you now, then you can just, and when they see you right now, they think, you ain't like what you used to be. You say, this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Amen? All right, now, so, so, Covetousness is idolatry. So let's, let's, let, let me back up just for a moment before I make this statement. I begin to look at God's design for us. Listen to this. God designed us to have needs and wants. Think of that. God designed us to have needs and wants. God designed us. And, I, you know, I don't, I don't want people to ever get into deception like you're not supposed to have anything that you need and you're not supposed to have anything that you want. That's not how you were designed. You were designed with needs and wants. So if you go around talking about, I don't have any needs and I don't have any wants, I mean, everything could be cool right now, but you live a whole life, you're going to need something. All right? You live a whole life, you're going to want something. So when that time comes, God is, God is saying, I am the one that will meet your needs and your wants. He designed us with needs and wants so that we might know him and delight in him as our provider and our sustainer. God wants to be your provider and God wants to be your sustainer. God wants to sustain you. God wants to provide for you. Do you understand how powerful that is? God wants to be the one. God, I like to say it like that. God is my supply house. God is my supply house. Please understand that God is my supply house. Before I go on, let, let's look at a couple of scriptures. First, let's look at Colossians chapter 2 and 10. Colossians chapter 2 and 10. Oh, hallelujah. I pray that, I pray that people will, will just run to God today and say, Lord, please forgive me for thinking that I was more than what I really was. Look at this. In verse 10, he says, and I just, I love this. He says, and you are complete in him. You are complete in him. I am complete in him. I think about that. I'm complete in Jesus. Glory to God. I am complete in Jesus. Hallelujah. I am complete, watch this, in Jesus. Now, I can remember a time, and you can remember a time where you were not complete because I believe you can only be complete in him. And, and I see people trying to be complete in, in everything else but in Jesus. I see people trying to be complete in their jobs. They try to be complete in relationships. They try to be complete in the amount of money they have. The only way you're ever going to be complete is in Jesus. You don't believe me? Try it. Let me tell you something. I've learned something about life, and here's what I've learned, that either you're going to let God teach you or life will teach you. I said, either you're going to let God teach you or life will teach you. And, and life will teach you in a ways that whether you like it or not, life will teach you. God would rather you receive his instructions 
but sometimes people don't do it. I am complete in Jesus. Release your faith for that. I am complete in Jesus. I'm complete in Jesus right now. Now look at Matthew 6, 32, 33. Now this is this point. We were created with needs. We were created with desires only we, so that God can meet those desires. God wants to be provider. God wants to be sustainer. God wants to be your supply house. Look at this next two verse. He says, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have what? Need of all these things. We're going to look at it in a moment. We're going to see what those needs were. They, they were physical needs. God, God knows you have need of all these things. You know, I'm grateful that some people are going to be getting stimulus checks, but I really want you to learn how to seek God because the government ain't going to keep sending you checks all your life. <laughs> and you please understand, there ain't nothing free, but you understand. The government ain't going to send you checks all your life. But I tell you what, God says, I know you have need. See, God knows your need before you knew you needed it. He says, but here's what I want you to do. Seek first the kingdom. I want to meet your needs. I, I, I want to I sustain you. I take great joy in meeting your needs and sustaining you. Everything you need, I want to be your supply. Everything you want, I want to be your supply. Man, when I laid down last night, I said, God, I just, I thank you for deep sleep. I'm trusting you for deep sleep in the name of Jesus. Glory be to God. And then when I get up after deep sleep, I'm like, look at the sustainer. Look at the provider. Glory be to God. He says, I'll meet your need. I'll, and, and, and I'll add things to your life. I'll meet your needs. I'll add things to your life. Now, now that I know that, let me shift back to what we were saying. Coveting is um, idolatry. So let's look at coveting to see what it is. Why would he say coveting is idolatry? Well, coveting, when you covet something, it turns our attention from God. When you covet something, you turn your attention from God and you place it on something of lesser value. When I covet something, I take my attention off God, and I put it on something that has lesser value than God. Coveting. Coveting, will, it leads us to believing that we can be satisfied in this life apart from God. Coveting wants to get you to believe you can be okay and satisfied in this life apart from God. Coveting is not just wanting something. It's not just craving something. Coveting is, well, I'm, I'm turning away from God because I believe that there is something better and greater. That's where we are. That's where we are in this world. I'm, I'm turning from God because I believe there's something greater of greater value. I'm turning from God and I'm going to turn to education. Education is good, but we now put value on education greater than what it really is. Listen to me carefully now. So let me take what coveting is, let me take how God designed us, and let me give you, I believe, a really root definition of idolatry. And here it is. Idolatry is the value that you give to a thing more than God. Idolatry is the value that you give to a thing more than God. See, the thing may not be wrong until you give it greater value than God. It may not be wrong for you to play golf unless you give golf greater value than God. So the question I want you to consider is, have you given any person or anything greater value than God? That's idolatry. It's the value that you give to the thing. Look at your life. Look at, look at your life right now. Have I given anything or anyone greater value than God? Because whatever thing in your life or whatever person in your life that you value more than God, then that thing or that person has become your idol and your value that you placed on it has entered, you have entered into idolatry. I'm trying to show you that God is the number one. He is the one that we should be looking at. And again, in Colossians 3, 5, idolatry, which is covetousness, 
is a foolish, here's what it is, idolatry is a foolish endeavor that takes a Christian and sends him grasping for satisfaction in all the wrong places. Idolatry takes a Christian and sends him grasping or trying to get satisfaction in all the wrong places. So, idolatry sends you away from God, and now you're going down the path trying to get satisfaction, but it's in the wrong place. You're not going to get satisfaction, uh, you know, in, in a job. You're not going to get satisfaction in, in the millions. You're not going to get satisfaction in the validation that other people give you. You're, you're, going, you're, going, you're, you're trying to grasp for satisfaction in all the wrong places. That's what it is. And I see that everywhere today. It's not God. God is like a second thought. It's not God. It's like, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't see God as the greatest, but I'm going to do, even, you know, it, you, you may think, well, I'm going to go into self-preservation mode, and through self-preservation mode, you're trying to grasp at satisfaction. That's the wrong, that's the wrong way. That's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. And we continue to go down the path that seems right, uh, but the end of it is destruction. And that's what idolatry does. And that's why it says to flee from it. That's why it says to, to, to have, don't be a part of it, because it will lead you down the path trying to get satisfaction in all the wrong places. Every one of us, we know somebody who fits this model of what we just shared with and what we're talking about. Now, before I look at the modern-day idolatry, there, there's modern-day idolatry. You know, social media helps to promote modern-day idolatry. Not wrong, but if you give it greater value than God, it is. Sex, not wrong in the place of marriage, but if you give it greater value than God. Uh, there's just so many things. Uh, image, uh, if, you, if you give it more value than God, what are you giving more value to God? You know what you have to do to do that? You have to completely say, God, I no longer believe that the path that you provided or you are, are my way out. I'm going to go and do other things that I see other people do. See, the problem is, is you're, you're, you're thinking that you know what other people have gone through, but you're not there to see the whole life. You're not there to see the whole, how the whole thing turns out. People can show you whatever they want to show you, and they can make things look as successful as they want to make things look. That's why you got to be careful. And then uh, what you don't know is they can't sleep at night. What you don't know is their family is all broken up. They ain't got nobody to love them. What you don't know is how sad they are. And what you don't know is how often they have to fight chronic depression and how often they have a gun pointed to their brains because they want to kill themselves. You don't know that because you don't live there and you're not there. And so people can make things look like it's perfect without God, but I can promise you, I'll show you a scripture in a moment. I can promise you it ain't never going to be right with something or someone in God's place because you were designed for God to take care of you. That's what you were designed for, for God to take care of you. Now, let's look at some Old Testament views of idolatry and what it says there in the Old Testament. Let's look at Jer uh, Jeremiah 16, verse 20, and then I want to look at Jeremiah 16, uh, 19 through 21 in the NLT. So let's look at King James first, Jeremiah 16 and 20. He says, shall a man make gods unto himself and they are no gods? Isn't that interesting? The number of people who have made gods unto themselves, but they're not gods at all. Even in some of the support groups that I used to run, one of the first things was you got to pick something out to be your higher power, your higher power. There, there, there's only one. I know about the highest power. And then people do stuff like, that chair is my higher power. And you're just, and, and this scripture says, shall a man make gods unto himself, and they are no gods? The things that you make are not gods? Look at this in the New Living Translation, Jeremiah 16, 19 through 21. Jeremiah 16, 19 through 21. And look at the warning where God gives us to just stay away from this. He says, Lord, you are my strength and fortress. You're my refuge in the day of trouble. Nations from around the world will come to you and say, our ancestors left us a foolish heritage, for they worshiped worthless idols. I've never seen any nation like our nation where we worship Hollywood like people in this nation do. I mean, actors can hardly do no wrong. And if they do, just make a good movie and it's all over. He says, can people make their own gods? 
These are not real gods at all. Wow. The Lord says, now I will show you them. I will show them my power. Now I will show them my might. At last they will know and understand that I am the Lord. You got to understand God's a jealous God. When you, when you proceed to try to crown something else as God, God is determined to let you know he the only one. God is determined to let you know, oh, you think that's your God? Oh, I'm going to show you that I am the Lord. And that's what a lot of people are looking at. They look at things that happen in their life because they've, they've just, they, some people have crowned themselves as God. I'm my own God. God said, oh, you really believe that? I'm going to show you who the Lord. That boy be knocked down so deep in a ditch, he'll have no choice but to scream out, God help me, God help me. That's where we are today. That's what we see throughout the entire nation today and the entire world. Look at Exodus chapter 34, 14 through 17 in the NLT. Exodus chapter 34, 14 through 17 in the New Living Translation. Check this out. The Lord says, the Lord's, uh, yeah, we, yeah, 14. You must worship no other gods, for the Lord whose very name is jealous. There's a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. Lord, have mercy. God is jealous about his relationship with you. Don't you know God is concerned when you start getting something and giving it greater value and he know that that thing didn't make you, that thing didn't wake you up this morning, that thing didn't start you on your way, that thing didn't heal you, that thing didn't take your care of your provision and you trying to make it God? He says, I'm a jealous God. I did all of that and I need to hear you give me the glory and the praise for what I did. He said, you must not make a treaty of any kind with the people living in the land. They lust after their gods, offering sacrifices to them. They will invite you to join them in their sacrificial meals, and you will go with them. Next verse. He says, then you'll accept their daughters who sacrifice to other gods as wives for your sons, and they will seduce your sons to commit adultery against me by worshiping other gods. You hear God's warning? He says, watch out how you relate with people who, who say something is God and it's not me. He says, you're going to get in a relationship with them, you're going to marry them, you're going to have sons with them, and what's happening? You're going to begin to build up a group of people who no longer receive me as God. You must not make any gods of molten metal for yourselves. This is the same attitude in the Old Testament. Do not replace me with anything or anyone. Don't do it. Don't get involved with people who have already replaced me. Don't marry people who already have replaced me. See, we just threw that out. At one time, we knew that we should not be unequally yoked. There's so many things that the world who has made their own God has now have influence on the church, and now you're doing the same thing. You're born again and marrying somebody that don't know God and wondering why it ain't working. Because your marriage relationship, one of y'all value something else more than you value God, and then you value God more than you value anything else, but when it comes together, it ain't working. It's not working. It's amazing to me how much idolatry the church has allowed to infiltrate its thinking by looking at television, and it told you the wrong vision. <laughs> by, by looking at social media and taking it, you know, as if it's the most important thing in, in the whole world. Do you, you don't even realize the, 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 the slander and the lies and the stuff that, that it does there, and, 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 and that's become some people idle. You got, listen, you remember, oh, I remember the 80s, I don't know, and, and in the bathroom we used to have a magazine rack. And you used to go in there, you know, and do your business and, you know, read, read a magazine or read your Bible. My grandma used to say, read your Bible, it'll come out right, read your Bible, <laughs> you know. Uh, but now, just notice, and everybody get caught up with this, now you wake up, the first thing you do is grab your phone. 
Wonder if that's one of those modern day idols. Look at this, man. This is, this is serious stuff. Come on, Je Jeremiah chapter 51, 17 through 19 in the New Living Translation. Jeremiah 51, 17 through 19 in the New Living Translation. He says, the whole human, human race is foolish and has no knowledge. He says, uh, the craftsmen are disgraced by the idols they make, for their carefully shaped works are a fraud. 18. The, these idols have no breath or power. They have no breath or power. Idols are worthless. They are ridiculous lies. That's true today. When you replace God, you replace them with a lie. Because there's a lie to think that you can replace him. It's a lie to think that you can put whatever you put in God's place. That's a lie. You put a lie in God's place. It's full of lies. On the day of reckoning, they will all be destroyed. But the God of Israel is no idol. He is the creator of everything that exists, including his people, his own special possession. The Lord of heaven's armies is his name. Look at the attitude even in the Old Covenant, which again gives us insight on a world that's filled with idolatry. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 19, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 19, and here's what I was, was saying to you, you earlier. When you look at your life, has money replaced God? I mean, some, for some people, money motivates you to do God's will quicker than God. It's definitely an idol. People don't believe in servanthood like they used to. Servanthood with selfish ending is hypocrisy. But people, people don't believe in servanthood no more. They've turned everything about church and servanthood into mammon-driven ministry. And that's not how it's supposed to be. We've replaced God with something else. And look what it says here, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 19. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and if you walk after other gods, and you serve them, and you worship them, I testify again uh, against you this day that you shall surely perish. Now, when I read that scripture, here's what the Lord said to me. You perish without God. Isn't that the truth? You perish without God. Uh, you lose without God. Your, 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 your life is, 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 is in the midst of destruction without God. And maybe life has to teach some people this because they don't believe it right now. I, I think about the amount of years that a person wastes by not listening to God. Life just kind of goes by because you spend all this time trying to prove to yourself that something's greater than God. I don't want that to be you, world changers. I want you to just wake up and shake your head and say, there's nothing greater than God. Because without him, you perish. Well, well such and so, such and so, here, Christian, they didn't perish. You don't know. You don't live with them. That's the thing you got to understand. You don't know you don't live with them. You don't know when, you don't know where. You don't know you don't live with them. They could be miserable. I have met some of the phoniest people ever that can get in the pulpit and make everything look like it's flawless, and they got, they're miserable. Miserable, miserable, miserable. And it shocks me sometimes because they get in the pulpit and I know they don't like each other. And they get up, good morning, sweetheart. How are you? Well, praise the Lord. And, they go, and I'm like, what the world? Me and Taff and I, we ain't even built like that. We, we, can't, we can't do phony. We, 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 if, listen, if Taff is mad at me, you're going to know it. I get up there, hey, Taff, how you doing? <laughs> wow. The church has perfected phoniness to preserve the image that has taken God out of first place. And now their image is more important than their God. Now their image is what they seek after. And I'm telling you, if you've ever looked at the world lately and asked what's going on, this is what's happening right now. God is being replaced with someone or something. He's being replaced. 
and it must not be so with us who are the people of God. And we got to be like the Apostle John. We got to scream it out loud. Every time something good happens, we got to say, that's my God. Until everybody at work know, oh, they, they know God. Back up a little bit. Well, how are you doing today? Well, this is the day the Lord has made. I thought you knew. But we have got to, listen, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God. I will not diminish my call for the sake of my image. Y'all don't understand what I'm just saying. I'm not going to, I'm not, listen, I've been called to be a preacher. But I know people who have been called to do something, they diminish their call because they didn't see it as important enough. They diminish their call for the sake of their image. And instead of saying they're a preacher or a pastor, they say, I'm a motivational speaker. Because that sounds better. Don't diminish your anointing for your image. Because one day people are going to look at you and they're going to wish they had your anointing. They're going to wish they had your God. Don't. Replace God with something or someone else. Flee from idolatry. Amen? Amen. Now, let's, let's get in this with, with the time we have left. Uh, let's look at some modern-day idols. Some modern-day idols. The first one I want to look at is what we just mentioned. I want to look at how people have turned their identity into an idol. Your identity or image, how they turned it into an idol. Now, having good identity and having good self-image, there's nothing wrong with that until you put more value on it than God. You see, when you don't trust God to be your provider, you will steal. When you don't trust God with your with who God made you, you'll go and try to get remade with some kind of surgery or something. You follow this? You, you, you don't, you, when, when, when you don't trust what God said about two coming together and be, being one, you're going to look for somebody else. We place more value in who we are rather than placing value in God and in, and, 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 and who he has said we are. So I place more value in my identity and trying to get it where other people will accept it. We place more value in who we are, and there's nothing wrong with that until you place more value in who you are and no, little to no value in who God says we are. So I'm not looking at who I am or who people think I am or what folks say about me, I'm looking at what God has said about me. God said I'm the righteousness of God. I place value in what God says. God says I'm righteous. God says I'm redeemed. See, you got to be careful not to allow the shame of other people uh, to cause you to look at yourself based on how they look at you. This entire nation is filled with shaming. You hear the phrase, you should be ashamed of yourself. And it becomes very difficult for you to, to stay focused on the identity that, that God has given you versus the identity that somebody else is trying to give you. You know, the church is still trying to give us the identity that we're sinners. I'm born again. I am no longer a sinner. I am not going to take the identity because bishop or archbishop such and so said that I am the righteousness of God the day I got born again, the day I made Jesus the Lord of my life. I am righteous. Well, if you was righteous, you wouldn't have did that. I am righteous anyway. Now, that was a stupid thing, but because I believe I'm righteous, eventually my behavior is going to line up with who I am. But if, it's, if, I start being, if I start believing who you say I am, then I'm going to actually start acting like that. So I value the identity that God has given me. And I will not be uh, pressured into accepting an identity that didn't come from God. I'm not going to be shamed into accepting an identity that doesn't come from God. I'm not going to be condemned into accepting an identity that comes from God. And then I replace my righteous identity with this shameful identity I'm not going to do it. 
And you know what? It take a, it take a, a mature Christian to do this. Taff and I were talking about this yesterday. Maturity is based solely on who you've decided will be your source. That's what maturity is. Maturity says, no matter what's going on in my life, I, I reach for Jesus every time. Immaturity is, is when you're, you've made something else your source or yourself your source. When something happens, you don't go to, for Jesus. When something happens, you don't reach for him. He's my source. That's a mature Christian. You're not mature because you've been saved a long time. You're not mature because you can pretend to be spiritually mature because every time you get around somebody, you, you, you act, you know, kind of a fake, fake spiritual. You know, hey, brother, how are you? Oh, ho ho hallelujah, that don't do nothing to me. I don't care how you act at church, and I don't care all the little jerking around you do. They ain't done, they ain't do nothing for me. I want to know when hell breaks out in your life, who do you reach for? Hallelujah. During the pandemic, who did you reach for? I'm reaching for Jesus. You wouldn't believe the number of people that got divorced in the pandemic, the number of people who have got molested in the pandemic, the number of people who got beat up in the pandemic, because God wasn't their source. And the distractions that they had from their reality showed up because God wasn't their source. But when God's your source and you reach for him, you reach for him when you're broke, busted, and disgusted. You reach for him when they diagnose you with a disease. You reach for him when you've been hurt, when you've been broken. You reach for him. That's the sign of a mature Christian. Not this little religious preacher stuff we get around and, you know, I can't, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I can't stand that. So I'll tell you what happened to me in the, in the middle of the pandemic. I can't, I can't stand a bunch of phony. Now ask the Holy Ghost what I said with your deep self. No, no, no. Not that you don't have problems. Not that you don't have issues. Not that you, not that, not that you don't stand in bad circumstances. But when you do, you reach for him as your source. You reach for him as your source. Lord, I shouldn't have said what I said. I, help me, Lord. You reach for him. Lord, I don't know where the money coming from, but I trust you, Lord. I ain't got but two pennies, but I'm going to show so these two pennies. I reach for you, God. I reach for you. Lord, my marriage is a wreck, but I got to go to you. Show me myself. I reach for you, Jesus. Lord, I'm depressed but I don't want to tell no Christians because if you tell Christians that you're struggling with depression, then they're going to condemn you. If you tell Christians that you're having a rough time mentally, they're going to condemn you. But I'm telling you, it's all right that you go through what you go through because you have a God that sits high and looks low, and he's ready to bring you up out of your situation. Who do you go to that determines your maturity? That determines your maturity. Not how much of the Bible you know. Well, I know all 66 books. Man, hush. <laughs> I know all 66 books. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. I operate in nine of the spiritual gifts. Ah, la, 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 la. See, I can see stuff right now. I'm a dirt. I ain't nobody. I don't want to. See, you, you are spooky. Something the matter with you. you. You actually probably have replaced God with yourself. Kela boo, yabba dabba doo. Uh-uh. No, no, no. That's the sign of maturity, that we go to God. God, help me not to hurt myself. Lord, help me to refrain my tongue from, from speaking guile and slander and, and, and make sure that I, I don't speak evil against somebody. You know, that's serious right here. See, the Bible says if you want to see good days and live a long life, Refrain your tongue from speaking evil and from speaking deceit and lies. I want to see good days. I, I'm off the subject a little bit, but I want to see good days. And I want to live a long time, which means I am not going to be opening my mouth and speaking stuff that don't need to come out of my mouth. Somebody told me about what somebody was going through the other day, and I said, oh, God bless them. In the name of Jesus, bless him. Well, what did he do? Well, how did he do it? Uh, -uh. Lord, bless him, because I want to see good days. And I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to live a long time, see good days. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. At home, wherever you are right now, lift your hands up. Just give God some praise right now. Lord, I give you praise. Just, just praise him right now. 
just praise and say, Lord, you're going to always be my number one. I just praise you right now, Lord. I just praise you right now. You're going to always be my, my number one. Praise the Lord. You see, the search for meaning, the search for value, and the search for validation from others makes you if you get it, but it breaks you if you don't. Yeah, when somebody validates you and values you and, and, you, and shows you meaning, oh, it makes you, but it breaks you when you don't. See, disappointment comes when you expect something and you don't get it. Then you're disappointed. And there are too many people that are putting their identity on the line. Are you serious? You're trusting the comment session of social media? Are you kidding me? You don't even know these people. You can get 20 good comments and just that one will mess with you the whole time. You're ready to fight for that one. Meet me down the street. I bet you won't meet me down the street. You are, yeah, you bad behind that comment section, but come on down the street. You take a picture of yourself thinking you look good and somebody could talk, say something nasty about you, how you look and everything. You, it, it start messing with you. Why would you do that? Why would you let that? Why would you let it mess with you? <laughs> well, Pastor, you against social? I'm not against social media. I ain't got it on my t my phone, so I, I I don't have it on my phone because I don't want to know what somebody's saying about me. <laughs> Why would I want to sit there and look on my phone to see what people said about me and then I carry it all day? That's so dumb. I ain't doing that. And I don't want nobody else coming to me telling like, you know what I saw on social media about you. I don't care. I ain't got it on my phone. I ain't hire you to give me no report. Keep it to yourself. Because <laughs> I've already decided that I value my identity in God more than anything else. Are you listening to me? And then what happens, you are willing to serve anything but God for reputation's sake willing to serve and do anything but God won't serve him because of your reputation. And, and, and uh, the series I just finished on servanthood, Jesus was of no reputation. He took on the form of a servant and he was of no reputation. You can't take on the form of a servant and be concerned about your reputation. You can't. You can't. God is the one that I trust. Look at this scripture here, 2 Peter chapter 2. 18 through 19 in the New Living Translation. I've never met so many people that are so concerned about what people think about them. So concerned about your image. I know leaders who are more concerned about their image than they are the people they serve. What's, what is that? Your image. Well, I'll tell you what. I don't know why Pastor Dollar wore that turtleneck this morning. I don't care. I ain't asked you. I didn't, did I send you a text this morning and ask you, is, would it be all right if I wore a turtleneck this morning? I ain't stunning you. I don't care if it's 100 degrees outside. I wear what I want to wear. And see, that's a, see, there's nothing more peaceful than being free and delivered from people. Nothing more peaceful than being free and delivered from people. The worst mindset you can have is the mindset always worried about what somebody think about you. I remember my mom used to have them, what are them jeans that used to hang, have them hang on? And, uh, pop jeans, mom pop jeans. I, I don't know what they called them, but I wore mine. And the only reason I talk about now, now here's the thing, my wife said, I, I'm throwing them away. <laughs> they were comfortable, at least I had room to walk in. These new jeans right here, they had you just kind of tiptoeing around, <laughs> you know. <laughs> ah, glory to God. Look at this. 2 Peter 2, 18 through 19 says, they brag about themselves with empty, foolish boasting. With an appeal to twist sexual desires, they lure back into sin those who have barely escaped from a lifestyle of deception. 19, they promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corrupt. For you are a slave to whatever controls you. You know, they got a big debate today about smoking weed. That, uh, you know, ain't nothing wrong with smoking weed. God created weed. If his creation ain't nothing wrong with weed. And, and see, you're missing the whole point. 
The issue with weed is not the issue. Weed ain't the issue. The issue with smoking weed is the value you put on it. If weed controls you more than God can control you, that's the problem. It ain't whether weed is legal or illegal. Because a whole lot of y'all were smoking weed before they made it legal. <laughs> that is not the issue. The issue is, is, is God doesn't want anything to control you. Whether it's weed or oatmeal cookie. <laughs> if the oatmeal cookie has caused you to be a slave to it, if an oatmeal cookie controls you, that's the problem. That's the problem. Is you are allowing other things to control you and won't even yield yourself to God? Are you serious? That that weed can get you to do more than what God can? For real? That's the issue. That you're willing to discipline, in, to discipline yourself in smoking weed, but you won't discipline yourself in fellowshipping with God? Seriously? Seriously? You know, you can show up every day to smoke some weed, but God ain't seen you in a month. What's wrong with that? You follow what I'm saying? That's what's wrong with that. We still, we still, see, we, we, we're trying to, we're missing the whole mark. You know, oh, I saw, I saw her drink a little wine last night. What wine? Well, I, I, I smell weed on them. See, you, that's that, that's that church folk kind of law-based condemning, shaming religion because you don't understand the whole point is I want to do things that will glorify God and I'm not going to let nothing control me or replace him. So what substance has replaced God in your life? What substance do you give worship to? Because every time you get in that weed and you start worshiping the weed. And the joy, the joy comes from the weed. The joy of the weed come. Not the joy of the Lord, but the joy of the weed come. <laughs> What's funny? Oh, no, ain't nobody even saying that. <laughs> God can't do nothing to you. God is giving you joy. You can't, can't, can't get nothing from you. And what we don't realize, that's idolatry. Replaced by something he created. Replaced by someone he created. He's no longer number one, no longer first love. Look at 1 John chapter 2, 16. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Mm -mm. God's number one. God's number one. I don't care what they say. I don't care where I am. Guy asked me the other day, he said, what? Would you mind if I asked you what you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor. Oh. Because in his mind, he might have thought, oh, just a pastor. I'm not going to let him diminish who I am with God. I, for lack of better words, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that, that, that God is first in my life. Amen. I'm not looking for somebody to call me and you won the award, and, and you're being honored by that. No, 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 no. I get all that from my God. God says, I'll honor you who honor me. And sometimes people can't take the honor that God gives to his people. God will start honoring you, and then they'll start uh, accusing you of stealing or doing something illegal to get it, but it's just honor. It's the blessings of the Lord that shows up. That's, they don't understand that, see? They only know that you can only get this by doing that but because they don't understand our God who is first. 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world. Now, 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 now this is going to show you what's worldly. Christian people, listen. you always talking about that's worldly. Worldly music. Well, what the heck is worldly music? That's a worldly shoe you got on. <laughs> What's a worldly? Or, or you know these little things that uh, 
women wear now and, 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 and come here and then it opens right here and it show a little shoulder and it come down right there? Oh, that's a worldly shirt. You're showing skin. It's too worldly. That's just worldly. What's worldly? See, the, the church, we're always behind on stuff and, and, and the church got to catch up with what the Bible say. I'm not talking about catching up with the times of the world. If you just catch up with the Bible, you can handle whatever time changes in the world. We just keep misinterpreting it. We have this flesh, this flesh faith instead of this grace faith. Yeah, leave it alone. Law-based living. Yeah, that's another thing. You know what really makes you a child? When you're still living by the law after Jesus came to give you this wonderful grace. Anybody that lives by the law is a child because he doesn't know how to operate skillfully in the righteousness of God. And he's, the Bible says he's still a babe and on milk. I don't know about y'all, but boy, I'm so tired of doing church, playing church. During the time of the pandemic, the, we learned that there's a difference between the church and the building. The building at the church, we're the church. We're the church. We're World Changers Church International, wherever you are. World Changers Church International at home with the stream, and you're World Changers. We've been the church. Throughout the entire pandemic, we have been the church. We never stopped being World Changers Church. The building is the building. But the building is not what carries the power. The power moved off Mount Sinai and moved on the inside of you and I, and we are the church. But the Scriptures here tells us what's worldly. So take the Scripture, and now you'll be able to determine what's worldly. He says, for all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, that's you wanting what you want. The lust of the eyes, that you wanting what you see. <laughs> and the pride of life, that's what I want to talk about. He says, it's not of the Father, but it is of God. The pride of life is simply, let me say, working to appear important in the eyes of others. Working to try to appear important in the eyes of others. When you're working so hard to appear important in the eyes of others and you put value on that, you appearing important in front of people, if you put value on that more than God, then the pride of life has replaced God. And I, I, I know so many people. It, it, it's hit all of us our desire to want to be important in front of somebody's eyes. And I finally realized, wow, that may be the game changer right there because imagine what God can do with someone who is of no reputation and who no longer considers it a very valuable thing to try to be important in somebody's eyes. Everything you do, you do it better because it's no longer important for you to be seen as important. Oh, that blesses me so much that no matter where I go in the world, it's not valuable for me to try to impress you. <laughs> it's not valuable for me to try to seem as if I'm important in your eyes. What's valuable to me is to know that I'm important in his eyes. And he's already declared that I've been accepted as the beloved and that I am important in his eyes. And, and if God's proud of me, if God's impressed, and then I can hear him say, my good and faithful servant, servant, servant. Every minister is a servant. Every church member is a servant. I, I don't know what it is. Let's graduate from being a servant, but my good and faithful servant, well done. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That, that's, what, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm going for. And I have found a great joy in not working, in not working to appear important in the eyes of other people. What freedom. Throughout this pandemic, there are some things that the Lord has taught me, and I'll pick up with this later. Number one, don't dwell in the past. 
some of us, we visit the past too much. Sometimes when we wake up and just land in the bed, we're visiting the past, the regrets, the brokenness, the shame, the things that we've done. Stay away from the brokenness of the past. Now, there may be some things in the past that were good that encourage you. That's cool. But even then, don't, don't live by past victories. There are new victories that God wants to give you. Okay? Secondly, that it is important to me not to appear important in front of other people. It's important to me not to appear important to other people. And then number three, don't rehearse your brokenness. <laughs> don't rehearse your brokenness and roll it over in your mind over and over and over and over again. I, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to get caught up in regrets and brokenness and run it over and over and over in my mind. You got to go forward. You got to go from that brokenness. There's no greater deliver, deliverance that I have ever experienced than the deliverance of not having to work hard to try to appear important. And so you lose a lot of stuff, name dropping, where you been, where you got, you lose a lot of stuff. And now there's more time to give the glory and the honor where it should be. I, um, I'm amazed at how much God has done. I'm amazed at how much he loves me. I'm amazed at the number of times I have to pull myself back. I think my wife might have got concerned one time because I told her, I said, I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about dying. <laughs> she was like, whoa. <laughs> because I don't see death as a lot of people see it. I see it as I'm about to I'm about to learn about things that I had never had a thought about. I'm about to see my Jesus. And when you're delivered from the fear of death, you become so powerful in the earth. Let's be free. Let's keep God at the center of our lives, and let's keep him at the head of our lives. And let's not fall victim to modern-day idolatry. We'll pick up with this on next Sunday. Let's pray. Wherever you are, pray. If you've got a teenager next to you, pray. I believe you're being delivered today. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you that by the power of the Holy Spirit, what I failed to say and what I failed to make clear, I am so grateful that the Holy Spirit is taking care of that. That even as I was preaching, words coming out of my mouth, I thank you that words were being ministered into their ears from you. I thank you the enlightenment showed up. They understood. And now, Holy Spirit, only you can do the increase. Only you can bring the increase. I, I'm, I'm a sower and, and I water, but you bring the increase. I pray that this word will become perpetual, that it, supernaturally it ends up in the ears of millions and, and it ends up in every nation around this world and, and it causes men and women to think, reconsider, wait a minute, what am I doing? He is my supply house. Oh, God. Oh, wonderful Jesus. We give you praise. May the power of the Holy Spirit envelop us. Thank you for walking with us. Thank you for not leaving us. Thank you for being a very present help in a time of trouble. We do give you praise. Oh, God, it's you. It's you that we want. It's you that we seek. It's you. Deliver us from ourselves. Deliver us from the idolatry of this world. It's you. 
We're in it for the relationship with you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name. Now, if you're here today and you're joining our services today and you've never been born again, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, and right now you're thinking, wow, I, I want Jesus in my life. I want him to be number one in my life. I've tried the rest, and now I'm ready to try the best, and Jesus is the best. If that's you, if you would just pray this prayer after me, I'll lead you to the Lord. Father, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died, he went to hell, paid the price for all my sins, was the ransom that was paid that I might be free from the consequences of not being able to keep the law. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Be my Lord and my Savior. And right now, by faith, I receive you as my Savior. And by faith, I declare that I am born again. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen.